months ago, before even coming to Sicklerville, I wanted to plan ahead and be ready to preach. And so I sat down and prayed and asked God to help me to know what to preach. And so months ago, I planned that I would start a sermon series beginning today. Not knowing there was going to be an installation and not knowing if there even was one, when it would be. But as it turns out, today is the beginning of what will be a sermon series on really how to, to love our neighbor. Learning how to be the church that God calls us to be. And so this morning, what I want to tell you is what you already know. This morning, I want to tell you what you're already doing. So you might say, well, Pastor, then why don't you just sit down? There's no really <laughs> reason to give us a sermon then. No. I want to give you a message because I want to say, keep doing what you're doing. And what I want to tell you to do is simply stick together. Let's stick together and be God's people. Let's stick together and serve. Let's stick together and worship. Let's stick together and be the church of Jesus Christ. Because if we look in the scripture, we find that the first church was doing just that. There's no better model for how to be the church than to look in Acts chapter 2. And Brian read it well for us, but I'm going to read it again. And this time, I want you to listen to how I'm reading it because of the the words that are used in here, there's no personal pronouns. You know, coaches are fond of saying, there's no I in team, right? It's the same for the church. Listen to how many times in the passage the references are to, to all or to them or themselves, as the early church is described. They devoted, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone, not some people, not some crazy guy in the corner, everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common, selling their possessions and goods they gave to anyone as the person had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, not mumbling and grumbling, coming together saying, oh, is it Sunday and we got to go to church again? <laughs> Praising God and enjoying, uh, listen up church, and enjoying the favor of all the people. So what did this lead to? And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. You want to grow God's church? Here's the recipe. Be the church. Come together as the church. Serve the community, the world as the church. Be the church. God calls us to share together in a wonderful way that only the church can do. I mean, did you hear what it said? They worshiped together. They, they sold their possessions and they put it in a big pot. And as anyone had need, they drew from the pot. So that it was like an early system of social security. Everybody was taken care of, but they had to let go of their stuff to put it in the pot. They had to trust the Lord. They had to trust that God was working in that group. And they had to trust each other in order to be the church. The church is the church when the people stick together. It's not about one person being a superstar. It's not about an individual person who teaches an awesome Sunday school lesson or someone who cooks great or is a super-duper usher. It's about all of us together bringing those gifts 
to making the church the light that it's called to be. We're not called to serve alone. We're called to serve together. Because together we can get more done. We can do more than what an I can do. And if we work alone and serve alone and try to be alone, sometimes bad things happen. Let me illustrate what I mean. I want to read for you a piece. It's actually a uh, description or a, an accident report form that was filled in. If someone had an accident and they had to fill, you know, for the insurance, an accident report form. And uh, the piece is called Trying to Do the Job Alone. It starts, Dear Sir, I am writing this letter in response to your request for additional information. In block three of the accident report form, um, I wrote as the cause of my accident, trying to do the job alone. You said in your letter uh, that I should explain more fully, so I trust that the following details will be sufficient. So here's the accident description. I'm a bricklayer by trade. On the day of the accident, I was working alone on the roof of a new six-story building. When I completed my work, I discovered that I had about 500 pounds of brick left over. Rather than carrying the bricks down by hand, I decided to lower them in a barrel by using a pulley, which fortunately was attached to the side of the building at the sixth floor. Securing the rope at ground level, I went up to the roof, swung the barrel out, and loaded the bricks into the barrel. Then I went down to the ground and untied the rope, holding tightly, to ensure a slow descent of the 500 pounds of bricks. Now you will note in block two of the accident report that I weigh 135 pounds. <laughs> Due to my surprise at being jerked off the ground so suddenly, I lost my presence of mind and forgot to let go of the rope. Needless to say, I proceeded at a rapid rate up the side of the building. In the vicinity of the third floor, I met the barrel coming down. This explains my fractured skull and broken collarbone. Slowed only slightly, I continued my rapid ascent not stopping until the fingers of my right hand were two knuckles deep into the pulley. Fortunately, by this time, I had regained my presence of mind and was able to hold tightly to the rope in spite of my pain. At approximately the same time, however, the barrel of bricks hit the ground and the bottom fell out of the barrel. Without the weight of the bricks, the barrel now weighed approximately 50 pounds. I refer you again to my weight in block two. As you might imagine, I began a rapid descent down the side of the building. Somewhere in the vicinity of the third floor, I again met the barrel coming up. This accounts for the two fractured ankles and the lacerations of my legs and lower body. The encounter with the barrel slowed me enough to lessen my injuries when I fell onto the pile of bricks. And fortunately, only three vertebrae were cracked. I am sorry to report, however, as I lay there on the bricks in pain, unable to stand, and watching the empty barrel six stories above me, I again lost my presence of mind and let go of the rope. The empty barrel, weighing more than the rope, so it came down on me and broke both my legs. I hope that I have furnished the information that you required as to how the accident occurred, because you see, I was trying to do the job alone. Things work so much better when we work together as a team, don't they? 
working together as a team. Think about what the Apostle Paul said in the New Testament when he talked about the church. He compared the church to the human body. And he said, you know, just like we have ears and eyes and arms and toes, you know, all those things work together. And it's amazing to me, you know, if you want to walk, for those that you are able to walk easily, you know, you just sort of take a step and you don't even really think about it, right? You just, your leg goes forward. And, but what's going on is, you know, the brain sends a signal through the nervous system to the nerves. I'm not a doctor, so I don't know all the details, but this is sort of how it works. And then, you know, signals the muscles so that the legs know to move. All that happens instantly. But it can only happen if the body's working together and that system is coordinated. Paul says that's the way the church is supposed to be. If everybody wants to be an eyeball, we'd be a goofy-looking church. You know, we need hands, we need elbows, we need all, all the different parts. When your human body doesn't work right, if your hearing starts to go or your eyesight starts to fail, or you've got arthritis so that your limbs don't work like they used to, then, then your body's compromised, isn't it? And you can't do all that you want to do. And you can be frustrated. I believe the same happens with the church. If we're not all bringing what we have to the table, if you have a gift... You have a, a, a gift, a talent that God's given you, and you're using it for selfish purposes, and you're not surrendering it to the Lord to be used in the church. You're holding out. You're holding back. And this body is not as strong without you. If you can give an offering, a full offering, not just uh, giving God a tip, but saying, Lord, you've given me everything, and I need to respond by faith by giving a real offering. An offering that says, I appreciate God what you do for me. If we don't give a full offering then we're holding back, and we're limiting what the church can do. God may want to do all kinds of amazing things in Sicklerville, but it, maybe it can't happen because we're not all in. We're the body. We're the parts. And to the degree that we say, yes, Lord, we're going to stick together. I'm going to stick with the church. To the degree that we do that, we can do ministry together in the name of Christ. Are we always going to agree? No. Are we going to see things differently? Yeah. Are we, some, are we sometimes going to have a little conversation that gets maybe even um, enthusiastic? Did I say that right? Yes, we will. Because we're all different. Because it's so beautiful that, that you see it this way, I see it that way. But if we're sticking together and if we're unified in the spirit, God will lead us through that process to find what the truth is. If we're just always bickering, then we don't have a witness. Do you want to join an organization where the people in the organization can't even get along with each other? Come join our church. <laughs> yeah, we're a great bunch. Really, you're going to love it. Yeah. No. You know, it's like jogging. You watch joggers, <laughs> and a lot of times they're like, <laughs> and the jogger says to this friend, hey, you want to come jogging with me? <laughs> oh, can I please? It looks like so much fun. Let me just put my shorts on and get out there with you. <laughs> no. We have a witness as a church. It's one thing about what we think about each other here. What are they saying at Wawa about Sucreville United Methodist Church? What are they saying at the diner about Sucreville United Methodist Church? You ever wonder that? I wonder about it. I want to know what the community thinks about our congregation. Because that's our witness. And if we expect to grow and invite anyone to come be a part of us, we've, we've got to have a strong witness for Christ. We need to stick together. John Wesley, do you know that name? John Wesley, of course, the leader of the Wesleyan movement that became the Methodist Church, he had a great saying, and I'm not going to quote it per se, it's a sort of a paraphrase, but what John Wesley said was, as a church, there needs to be unity in the essentials and flexibility in the non-essentials. 
you know what that means? Unity and the essentials mean the important, serious things, the, the, the major doctrines of the Bible we need to agree on to be the church. We need to agree that Jesus Christ is the Lord, right? We need to agree that he died and rose from the dead and that he lives forever and that he lives in the hearts of those who believe and follow. You know what I mean? Those are the essentials, and there's other essentials, but those are just a few. We need to believe that and agree on that to be the church. Now, when you take communion, do you need to, to stand? Do you need to be at the altar? Do, is it okay to be sit, sitting in a pew? Well, you know, well, you can do either, right? It's, it's not like you're not a Christian if you're not kneeling when you take communion. You follow what I mean by the non-essentials? Those things, as a church, we just sort of work those things out. But we need to be uh, agreeing on the major things. We need to have uniformity on the major doctrine. Because that's where the church gets its power, in its agreement on those major doctrines. That's where Christ is at work in those things that we all believe together. So if we're different, different is good. Diversity is good. And I've got to tell you the truth. When I found out I was coming here to be your pastor and I looked through the pictorial directory, I said, wow, this is, this is a rainbow church. There's people of different colors. There's people of different backgrounds. There's people from different countries. I think that's wonderful. I think that adds a richness to this congregation. Amen? Yeah, it's terrific. And I think it's wonderful that people can come from different backgrounds and be in one church and be part of one congregation and get along. Yes, there are times when we have little issues, and we work through those as we pray and as we seek God's truth in those. But if we're going to really have an impact in this community, if we're going to build a new family life center, and we're going to really reach out to this area and say, hey, we are here, and we are here for you, and we are here in the name of Jesus, if that's going to happen, then we have to stick together and be the church. Because that's how real ministry is going to happen. I just want to close with a story that's told by a reporter. He was in Sarajevo at a time of a major conflict, and he was trying to get the story. And this one particular day, there was an incident where a child, a young child, was struck by a sniper's bullet. Hit this little girl in the back of the head, just tore off part of the back of her head. And this reporter just threw down his pad and his his pen, and he ran to the man who was holding this little girl who was bleeding. And he ran to the man and he said, come on, get in my car, I'll take you to the hospital. So the reporter gets in his car, and uh, the man's holding the girl, and he gets in the back seat with the little girl, and he starts out, he hits the accelerator, and he's speeding to the hospital, and the man in the back seat is saying, sir, hurry, please, my child is still breathing. And so he's pushing harder on the accelerator, and he's going as fast as he can, and two minutes later, the man in the back seat says again, sir, Please, hurry. My child, she, she, she's, she's moving still. Hurry. And then again, one more time before they get to the hospital. Sir, please, hurry. My child, she, she's turning blue. By the time they got to the hospital, they declared the little girl dead. She didn't make it. And so afterwards, the two men, the reporter who was driving and the man in the back of the seat are in the men's room and they're they're washing the blood off their hands and their clothes. And as they stand there at the sink, the man who was in the back seat holding the girl shakes his head and says, oh my, now I have such a terrible job. I have to go to that little girl's father and tell him that his little girl is dead. And the reporter said, wait a minute. I thought that little girl belonged to you. And the man looked at the reporter and he said, don't they all belong to us? Don't all the hurting children belong to us? Don't all the men and women who are hurting souls out there in the world belong to us? Hasn't God made all of us? Aren't we all children of God? Aren't they our brothers and sisters? If we have any hope of reaching them, if we have any hope of bringing the saving message of Christ to the world, if we have any hope of being a healing station for Christ, can't do the job alone. We have to stick together. Amen.